Hi everyone and welcome to this session of the online distilling conference. We are thrilled to have Robert Piggott back again uh, from Lalamond. He's going to be uh, talking about some really um, interesting subject matter which I know is uh, always a favourite with our viewers. Um, the talk today, a new way to sour mash, intentional inoculation of lactobacillus in spirits production process. Robert, over to you. Thank you, David. This, this presentation is something somewhat different. We have been souring mash unintentionally for many, many years. This gives us a way potentially to control this and get some different flavors in your final product in a controlled manner. But first, just a quick word about Lalamond. I have to do that. Um, it's a privately Hell Canadian Company, founded at the end of the 19th century. Uh, we specialize in the marketing of yeast and bacteria, hence the lactobacillus. Uh, 12 business units covering everything from animal nutrition, brewing, distilling, specialty cultures, health care, etc. Um, we got more than 4,000 employees and we're located in 45 different countries on five continents. But our little group, Lalamond Biofuels and Distilled Spirits and Lalamond Craft Distilling, we work internationally, but we have local people around the world to help you in your area with local knowledge and expertise. Just a bit of idea of what we do. Uh, we give you dedicated support. We have a lot of people who know a lot of about distilling and making beverage alcohol. We do education, uh, craft distilling seminars, the alcohol school, our products, yeast, nutrients, enzymes, and bacteria. But the big thing is we develop partnerships to help you get the spirit you want and grow your business. Okay, end of, end of commercial. A new way to sour mash, the intentional lock inoculation of lactobacillus in the spirits making process. Uh, what are we gonna talk about here? A little bit of the history of sour mashing, uh, overview of the world of uh, lactic acid bacteria, uh, the selection of the desired bacteria, some plant real world trials and results from 2020 and 2021, and some other applications that we can use this bacteria for. So what is sour mashing? Well, traditionally, this is an American uh, way of doing things. It comes from the old hillbilly days where they were making this up in the mountains and they didn't really do a very good job of it. So what it is, you recycle uh, some of your previous distillation into the next fermentation. How much you do that, it varies a lot, but normally about 20 to 30% of the distillation left in the still after you finish your distillation goes back into the next fermentation. Where did it come from? Again, distinctly American. It was modernized by, it's attributed to uh, Dr. James Crow of Old Crow Bourbon. But the vast majority of major bourbons today are made with the sour mash process. And trouble is though, this can be very hard to do on a craft scale, just because of your process, your timing and the volumes that you use. So just a little bit of the history and usage of sour mashing. Why do we, do a sour mash versus a sweet mash. No back set going back into the process. Well, first, like I say, the usage is likely historical, going back to the old uh, home distillers. And again, they were not very efficient. They didn't really have enzymes, the grind was poor, etc. So by recycling some of that mash that had been cooked in the still, 
we actually got a second cook. We got a lot of unfermented sugars coming back in the process. So we got a better, uh, well, reuse of the sugars. Inoculation of the next mash. Since the recycled back set often sat around for a few days, it was contaminated by local bacteria and yeast. We got nutrients that were released in the cook process in the stills and from the dead yeast from the last distillation that goes back again, gives you a better fermentation. And the other thing, it gave us a lower starting pH. It typically used to drop our pH from about five down into the uh, low fours or high, high threes. How do lactic bacteria tie into sour mash? Lactic acid bacteria is a key souring agent. It is by far the most common bacteria we find in our fermentation. And they obviously lactic acid bacteria produce lactic acid, which directly drives down the pH of the mash. How lactic bacteria tie into sour mash? that they contribute more than just a drop in the pH. The pH drop, as you will see later, does help us control other bacteria, et cetera, in the mash, which was good for the old time distillers. We have a diverse enzyme pool unique to lactic acid bacteria. So this gives us acids, et cetera, that we do not normally get in a clean mash with just yeast. So it means we utilize more of the substrate and we create more products that can give us more and different flavors. Why do we intentionally inoculate bacteria? Traditional sour mash process is very difficult at craft scale. It is not impossible, but it is not not easy to do. Again, your control of the souring is, is very, very difficult on craft scale. Bacterial souring is end goal in sour mash, so why not go straight to it? Put the bacteria in our own and control how it's done. So again, it's about controlling your process. What's going in? What's happening? What's not going in? We have control which has always been a problem with traditional sour mashing or doing bacteria sort of like the dunder pits etc that you will see in rum they aren't there is no control so let's take a look at the controlled process of sour mashing versus normal contamination when we get contamination in our fermentation you will see what's here on the right um, the, the pH will drop fairly slowly and it will keep dropping. It will, it will get quite low. The lactic acid rises slowly, but it keeps rising. And as you can see here, we have acetic acid rising all the time. Now acetic acid is quite detrimental, generally speaking to your fermentation. It's about 10 times more detrimental to your fermentation than lactic acid. So it's not something we want. So when we have a controlled sour mash, we have this, we, the pH comes down and the pH levels comes down quickly and levels off. The lactobacillus rises quickly and it levels off. And as you can see, it, it almost, since it does not generate uh, acetic acid itself, like some lactic acid bacteria, we get no acetic acid produced at all. So again, a very much more controlled fermentation than using the old way of just contaminating your process. So what are the requirements for bacteria? When we were selecting that bacteria, what did we look at and how do we use it? Well, 
It's a very active bacteria. It has high vitality. We put it in at the beginning of the process, but it has really, as you could see from the last slides, almost low lag phase. So it gives you a very quick pH drop and lactic acid production. It, it's not able to produce acetic acid from glucose or fructose. It, it cannot produce it. So it was selected for that. And it's not ethanol tolerant. So it dies off very quickly. It does not continue in your fermentation. We also were looking at a bacterial product that has a good aromatic impact. Uh, it doesn't produce off flavors or off characters in your mash. As a diversification of positive aromas and an important enzyme pool of the, to develop and produce more esters and aromatic compounds. So this will give you a different spirit from what you will produce without it. You may like it, you may not like it, but it will be different as you, you will see. The type of bacteria we chose was uh, Lactobacillus plantarum. It's, uh, it prefers a pH uh, over 3.5. Uh, it can survive only in very low ethanol concentration. So there's no risk of any residual bacteria. It works very well up to 33 degrees centigrade. So it works very well in normal fermentations. It doesn't produce acetic acid from C6 sugars. And it contributes to the aroma profile of the spirit and it will dominate any indigenous bacteria in there. So again, it gives you a much more selected bacteria in your mash than if you just let it go by itself. And this just gives you a, an idea of how we selected the bacteria, uh, lactic acid bacteria, various lactic acid bacteria and the selected strains. Just to give you an idea of the enzyme pool that we develop, some of these are very, very useful to you. Um, we, we release some bound aroma compounds. Um, the, we, we can met, metabolize uh, phenolic acids and we do not have any arginine deamase. Uh, so no ethyl carbamate is formed by this bacteria. That can be very important uh, in this present day and age where people are looking at ethyl carbamate production. So let's take a look at the real world. That's enough of the theory and why we selected this. How are we using it? We're co-pitching it with the yeast at the start of fermentation. Uh, the trials you were going to see, uh, we they would yeast was uh, Distillamax GW at uh, 0.5 grams per liter, and uh, the selected uh, Lactobacillus plantarum was added at 0.1 gram per liter. The temperatures were 25 to 32 degrees centigrade. Uh, the bricks, 18 to 22, and the fermentations were three to four days. The first one is a rye whiskey fermentation. It was done in the States, hence the E in the whiskey. It was 75% rye and 25% corn using uh, commercial enzymes. As you can see, the Kinetics remain the same. Your final alcohols, et cetera, are basically the same, but um, your pH dropped much, much quicker and flattened right out. The kinetics are quite consistent. As you can see, we end up with basically the same amount of alcohol, but there are some very different numbers yet. Alcohol contents quite close 
to the same, no real difference. The lactic acid though, of course, is much, much higher. And as you can see, the acetic acid, as we expected, is much lower. So we're getting less acetic and much more lactic acid in our fermentations. What did the customer say about this? Um, fermentation and distillation, the yield, et cetera, were very similar. There was no noticeable difference. But what was noticeable was a higher ester content right off the still. The distillation produced fruity aromas. As the distillation progressed, the customer was very happy and basically barreled it all off and we're going to try it again in a year's time. So what, what did the chemical analysis say? Well, something similar to what we would expect. Um, isoamyl acetate, your bananary sort of character, as you can see. Since we had a lot more lactic acid, we, we produced a lot more isoamyl. Uh, ethyl acetate, less acetic acid, a lot less. Um, so again, a different balance in your flavors. And this goes right the way across ethyl hexanoate, ethyl lactate, which we would expect to be higher because we have more lactic acid. So as you can see, a different range of congeners, a different flavor profile, gives you a different character spirit. And when we did a blind tasting on it by our international panel, again, this, this is what, what sort of came up. Obviously the same basic profile, same yeast, same, fermentation characteristics, but definitely a, a peak in that fruity, fruity character. So, okay, totally different spirit. Uh, second trial was done in the distillery in France, again, using GW. This, this was a corn fermentation, 80% corn, 20% malted barley. So again, not the same flavor profile as rye, quite different. The temperature was 30 to 33 degrees centigrade. The control was with no LP. And um, then there was a trial with L uh, Lactobacillus plantarum at 0.1 gram per liter. We did a GC analysis on it and a sensory evaluation. And what we see here is exactly the same thing that we saw before. Very different balance of congeners in, in the process. Um, particularly your isobutanol, um, ethyl lactate, which we would expect, um, ethyl decanoate, so again, different range of flavor esters, et cetera, to give you a different character spirit. Um, sensory evaluation, again, done by the blind, by the international panel, came out with about the same amount of fruit, more, more cereal note, but again, the same basic profile, just slightly different. So again, gives you a, a similar spirit, but a different spirit. So very interesting and a unique tool. So what we've shown, it works well on grain. So what else can we use it on? Well, we've tried it on all sorts of grain, uh, including single malt whiskies. And it worked very well on the single malt whiskies, uh, some softer, some fruity flavors and more rounded. But there's no reason we can't use it on any, any other grains. It will 
basically produce exactly the same. And that's one advantage in the craft distilling industry that you have. You are able to use a lot of these minor grains, unusual grains, give yourself different characters. And this is just an extra tool in your toolbox to give you again, a different character to the products that you're making. Molasses uh, or fresh cane juice. We've tried this. I have not got any plant data on it, but it works very well in fermentation, but don't add it to the dunder. This will not give you a dunder pit. It is, is not what it's intended for. So it goes into the fermentation, not into the spent wash for using as dunder. In uh, fresh cane juice, it, it worked well. It gave us notes of citrus uh, and, and lactic. In, in molasses, um, kinetics worked very well and it gave a very interesting final spirit. But again, don't think of this as giving you a high ester Jamaican style rum. That's, that's not what it's intended to do but it will give you a, again, a different spirit. Agave, these are just lab trials, but we were, we're trying in agave because agave is a very different fermentation, a very different spirit. Obviously almost 100% fructose that we're fermenting in there. So again, 24 hours, as you can see, lactic acid going up all the time, uh, fructose down. So this is our control. This is 0.1 grams per liter of lactobacillus plantarum. And this is one gram. So this orange one is 10 times the dosage. As you can see at the end, lacto Lactic acid goes up. The fructose is basically all fermented out. So quite interesting results also on agave. So it does work on agave. So what am I presenting here? I'm saying you have a new tool to give you a distinctive and unique spirit. Whether you like it or not, that's up to you, but it's a, it will give you a distinctive and unique spirit that is different from what you're making at the present time. It works on various feedstocks. Um, it works with various strains of yeast. Because it's selected, it has no impact on the amount of ethanol produced. Uh, it does give you actually quite good pH control. It gives you some control on other bacteria. It does dominate other bacteria. So if you're having bacterial contamination issues in your process, this can help you. It has a moderate impact on your higher alcohols and it has an impact on your esters and your fruity characters. So again, something we think is very interesting to try. And that's it. I thank you for listening and I hope you've, you've learned something from this.